Today's discussion will be presented in three sections since we are recording it for a radio broadcast on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. You're welcome to post questions and comments during the session and we'll try to answer them online. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Tom Timmon, host and managing editor of the Federal Drive on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM, federalnewsradio.com. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Our guests today are Josh Franklin, Information Security Engineer at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Brian Vereen is Chief for the Cyber Threat Intelligence at the Justice Department. Vincent Sridipan, Program Manager for Mobile Security Research at Homeland Security's Science and Technology Directorate. And Bob Stevens, Vice President of Public Sector at Lookout. Great to have you all here today. And you know, our topic is mobile and mobile data and mobile data security. And this is really a moving target. And I was thinking today I, about my first mobile device was a, was a Palm 7 that was on a 9-bit network for you know, low-end <laughs> text data and retail information. But it worked. Today, you know how things are broadband to every Palm in the country, if you will. And I think that uh, while the devices have not really changed that much in the last few years, they're all pretty much 4G, LTE, and et cetera and with graphic displays, the way the government uses them has really evolved a lot. So they're much more enterprise oriented. They have a lot more data, if not on them, at least that they can access for purposes of calculating and so forth. So maybe why don't we do a, a set here, uh, a set point with where you see mobility right now as it exists in government at the, at the most advanced level. Brian, why don't we start with you? So mobility, where I see it, uh, we're kind of in our infancy because we, we've had these things for about 10 years and uh, we know the easy stuff was knocked out first, the email, uh, some of the text messaging and obviously the voice. Uh, now what we're seeing is the enterprise, uh, they want to have everything at their fingertips. So uh, a lot of the applications that you might use internally, they want to have uh, access, you know, your customers want those, that access right on their uh, palm of their hand. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot of changes coming in the next 10 years. There's going to be a, obviously a need for security. So um, we're just starting to do a lot more with mobile and uh, because of that we're going to need to manage them a lot tighter. Uh, those things are sitting out on the open internet. Um, they're not behind your firewall, so it's uh, kind of a challenge. How much do you put out there? Um, and what kind of countermeasures do you put in place so if the thing uh, does get compromised, you can uh, take care of it and you, you have some kind of disposition of what happened to it. And accurate to say at Justice, it's not just the FBI that's going here, but a lot oh, of the no, other components. The whole department, um, you know, we have quite a few, uh, we have many other uh, components within us and boards and uh, divisions. So, uh, yeah, we, we have uh, just a whole host of mobile devices and uh, we have a pretty diverse mission set anywhere from you know, the FBI, what they do, uh, the law enforcement side, but we also have uh, incarceration, we have the uh, litigation components, uh, there's there's a lot more. So, and they all use mobile differently and they all uh, want it out in the field, especially for the agents, right? They're out in the, they're out on the street, they, they need to have that data right there with them um, rather than, you know, coming back to headquarters and checking on things. Yeah, and Vincent, I would say one of the big differences perhaps, maybe you could elaborate on this, is that where uh, laptops, computer, notebook computers, were sometimes on your Ethernet network, sometimes on Wi-Fi, even on broadband. These devices are never on the protected Ethernet yeah, there's wire. A, there's a huge difference, I mean, between what we would consider traditional laptop desktop versus mobile. I mean, if you, if you look at it, um, on your laptop, everything has to go through uh, a VPN, a, a trusted internet connection. You know, we have layered protection there. On mobile, currently, uh, nothing's required. Y you'll hopefully see this in FISMA for uh, FY18, uh, for mobile-specific metrics. That's We can talk about that later, but um, that's actually one of the things that is coming about. Uh, things like continuous diagnostics and mitigation is, is including mobile in their future as they go forward. So you're seeing, you know, a change. I mean, there's a paradigm shift for enterprise IT in general, so, and mobiles is just apparent. It's there, right? The users want to use it, but the enterprise IT legacy, what we're used to, we're, we don't manage it the same way and we're not used to it. So you're seeing policy, you're seeing uh, metrics, security metrics and compliance actually start to, to pick up. It, it hasn't been there before, but it's actually going in that direction because we have a reliance on it. There's, there's actual 
folks out in for the department that actually don't have a laptop or a desktop. All they have is a phone sometimes, and they don't always come back in and check check in. So how do they how do they work, right? How do we provide protections? And so we're seeing that paradigm shift today. It sounds like uh, with respect to continuous monitoring, the easy part, if you can call it that, is already done. If we haven't gotten to the mobile devices and monitoring them yet. Yeah, so, and I, and I don't necessarily want to speak for that program. Um, we did meet with them yesterday, and that was great. Um, so that so I know that it is uh, coming and on the horizon. We, it is recommended in our study that we did to Congress. Um, but the idea here is that, you know, hardware, software, asset management is the first step. Um, knowing what you have and then doing something about it, um, you know, figuring out how you protect it, how do you remediate if something bad goes, it happens. Um, those are things that I'll say that, you know, it's a little bit in its infancy and as a starting point, but it, it'll ramp up quite quickly, I mean. Sure, and uh, Josh, everybody expects NIST to be the final word on mobile security, <laughs> and you do have publications out on that, but how do you keep up with the moving target, and wh where do you know where to look to, to put your arrows next? Yeah, yeah, I mean, a you know, huge part of that are, is basically talking to you know folks here uh, that you see at this table, uh, basically talking to other, you know, government agencies, folks in industry who are, you know, building these products that are actually, you know, going to be defending our networks. And then basically just, you know, speaking with mobile architects, folks who are, you know, in charge in industry for, you know, deploying large amounts of mobile devices in their enterprise. Okay, and, and uh, Bob, uh, Lookout has a really good uh, agnostic chart here, a matrix of the threats in mobility. And you've got apps, devices, networks, and content, and then for under each one of those there's a threat and a vulnerability and a behavior or configuration that's desired to mitigate that. Mm -hmm. Maybe walk us briefly through that, that matrix to give us an example of, of you know, the corners of, of the security challenge. The matrix is really what we refer to as the spectrum of risk that exists in the mobile environment. Um, it's uh, four categories. It's the applications on the devices, so you have to look at um, is there malicious um, behavior um, or is there risky behavior in the application. Um, there's the device itself that may be compromised, um, the operating system um, that has to be monitored to ensure that it's not compromised, uh, the network to make sure that the, there's no man in the middle attacks. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, the content, which, is, which comes via the web. So ensuring that people are, are safe browsing, uh, things of that nature. And so there are technologies and techniques that you can use to kind of button up these devices. But I wanted to talk about the, uh, just for a moment, the operating system in devices. There are several out there, and a given collection of devices in an agency could have several operating systems. To what extent do the manufacturers help in this process by keeping their things buttoned up and keeping up with what federal standards are for this? I think maybe that's something you see more in the desktop operating system venue than you do in mobile, but you tell me. So there, are, there are threats, right? Um, uh, I'll, I'll mention that, yes, you know, it's primarily dominated by iOS and Android. Um, not, not to name anyone in particular, but the reason why there's a, a domination there is because uh, the marketplace, right? The, the mobile app store that, that resides there. So having uh, the uh, availability of you know, millions upon millions of, of unique mobile applications for use, it's the reason why people go and use that operating system. As far as uh, trust in a manufacturer, I mean, I will say uh, from our perspective, and, and it's not necessarily because we have a great relationship with um, NIAP um, from NSA, but commercial solutions for classified component lists is where I would go. Right, um, picking a device that has been evaluated, picking a device that has been certified, uh, at least the, the firmware and hardware, you always want to use the latest operating system. Um, I would avoid using no-name devices, I mean, uh, if possible, or maybe not brand name. Um, example would be, you probably saw the blue phone. Um, it, Black Hat it was it's, uh, given again, so they got caught the second time. Uh, so what do they do? They it's a number one selling smartphone on Amazon. It's it's now not banned anymore, so that you can use it or you can buy it. But um, they were aggregating data uh, essentially out of the box, and you, you it's things like uh, essentially the firmware over the air update. Um, was actually outsourced to Shanghai AdUps LTD. So guess where your data was going? Uh, not in the US. Uh, and aggregation of data, it's all public. So 
I'm not going to get in trouble, uh, but it, it's the aggregation of data and things like your text messages, your web browsing history, um, uh, contacts, and other things were actually shipped out like every 72 hours based on a keyword that was that was pulling it. So you're seeing that today, even though it's a U.S. manufacturer, you can't trust the device that you pick, right? Um, those are types of things that uh, you should be weary of. Yeah, Brian, that's a that's a good point because often the devices just by out of the box back up to one or more manufacturers own clouds which is convenient for consumers but that may be not where you want Justice Department data to be backed up. Yeah, I mean we've had a pretty good, uh, pretty good run with the uh, the vendors that we choose. Um, they oper the the operating systems are pretty locked down for uh, the mainstream uh, manufacturers, so uh, there's not a lot of um, exploits that come out for those. And when they do come out, the manufacturers are typically pretty good about uh, putting out updates uh, very quickly. Uh, the the issue that we have is uh, unlike when we when we're on prem, uh, we we know about a vulnerability. Let's say it takes uh, company X five days to patch it. What do we do in the meantime? Well, if it's built inside the data center, I can put up firewall rules. I can, uh, you know, increase my filtering and do some things like that. Uh, when the system's out, you know, on the on the user's belt, uh, how do I protect that thing while it's vulnerable, you know, while there's that gap between when it's vulnerable and when there's a patch available. Uh, the other thing, with a lot of the automated patch management systems for on-prem, we can push patches by ourselves. There uh, have been a lot of tools that basically allow the management to push updates to those uh, mobile devices. So uh, that's one of the uh, issues that we have. The other thing that we're seeing, uh, just came out a couple weeks ago at Black Hat, was these systems have been pretty successful at security. So rather than target the operating system and the application, now they're going after the hardware. So uh, there's, I think, five, five billion or a billion devices that are now vulnerable to a hardware hack. Uh, that was demonstrated. So now uh, the manufacturers have all had to go out and, and do that. So uh, the more they lock those systems down, the more the attackers are going to go around and try to find a different way. Um, so it's the, the, one of the things we're just trying to find is how do we mitigate mobile threats, you know, outside the network that we really don't have the flexibility uh, to, you know, we can't put a firewall on every every iPhone. Right. Sure. So a hardware hack. It still has to come in through software somehow, right? I mean, unless yeah. You get I mean, the the way they're they're pulling it off is they're interacting with the radio, and it's uh, it's a portion of the the phone that not most security systems aren't going to to look there because at some point the uh, the device has to communicate with which radio, whether it's cellular or the uh, Wi-Fi, uh, and it's just not a place a lot of manufacturers had had looked at. It was hey, this this is how it works when it connects to the Wi-Fi. This is how it works when it connects to the uh, phone system and now there's the, the attackers are starting to go after those um, you know before the stack really starts so a we're third radio to Bluetooth I guess correct maybe that's yeah. another one. so we're uh, an NFC and you know and they'll add more right they're they're gonna they're gonna keep adding stuff to them so everything that we add all the convenience that we have the bad guys are gonna try to go after them so uh, it'll be pretty interesting and a lot of our the other thing too is a lot of our phones are in pretty hostile areas right we're not they're not just here in DC we have uh, people worldwide some countries that may not exactly see eye to eye with us, so uh, and we're under their control while that phone is on their network. Interesting, yeah. Plus, just normal travel by federal employees to just not even into war zones, but to other countries. Uh, there's pretty much, you know, that that danger is always there. So, Josh, is there is there is that part of the future guidance that we are expecting in research with respect to, you know, those elements of hardware that nobody thought about till till now. Yeah, so NIST does have guidance for, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, hardware rooted security in mobile devices. Um, we also have guidance for, you know, mobile network operators and folks writing software that actually interacts with the, the uh, cellular network. Um, and then, you know, we also have guidance for, you know, folks to actually deploy mobile devices in there you know, in their enterprise. Uh, and so we're, you know, looking to, you know, finalize and, uh, you know, do some more research in those, in those areas in the very near future. And Bob, you have kind of a view across government from the, from the lookout, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> point of view. <laughs> well, pun intended, I guess, maybe. And uh, what does it look like to you? I mean, how, how aware are agencies of things like the, uh, the, the, the radio vulnerability that something, first I've heard of it, but it came out of Black Hat a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and the blue phone and that kind of thing? Well, uh, what's interesting is you know, Lookout was actually founded based on a uh, on a Bluetooth vulnerability. 
Uh, it's kind of an interesting story. The co-founders found uh, a vulnerability in Bluetooth. Um, they took it to the manufacturer. The manufacturer sort of ignored them. Uh, mm -hmm. Said, yeah, you got to be within 15 feet of the device. So, um, of course, being young and um, and uh, excited, they uh, they said, well, that's not good enough for us. So they went and developed a, a device that allowed them to sit about a mile and a half away from the Oscars and and uh, mm -hmm. access people's contacts via the, the Bluetooth vulnerability. So, so Lookout's very aware, uh, and and again, it's what we we started the company with. Um, from an outside view, the government has kind of a broad spectrum. Um, you know, DHS I think is a little more advanced in regard to mobile security and. Uh, understands the seriousness, um, but there's other agencies who who are frankly doing you know nothing, um, just because it's not a priority for them. Uh, they don't see it as a, as big a risk uh, as some of the other um, uh, exploits of the network. So, um, I I also think that it is it is gaining momentum, and I say that because uh, I think that a lot of agencies are starting to budget for uh, for a mobile security solution. Um, which I think is, is fantastic news for, um, uh, for the government um, because in the end what we really want to do is we want to try and make government employees more productive. Uh, we want to allow them to, you know, when they're on a trip to be able to access the United app or the Avis app or the Hertz app or any of those um, so that uh, they can make their lives more efficient just like they do in their, their private lives. Um, so um, in the end I think it's about making them productive, um, also ensuring that they're secure while they're productive. All right, we'll take a break on that note. I'm your moderator, Tom Temin. This discussion is Securing Federal Mobility from the Full Spectrum of Mobile Risk, sponsored by Lookout and Carisoft, here on Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com.